Joining us now is Devlin Barrett, reporter covering the FBI and the DOJ for The Washington Post. Also with us is Joyce Vance, former U.S. attorney and co-host of the Sisters in Law podcast. Devlin and Joyce, thanks for being here. Devlin, let me first just start with you and in terms of your reporting and the reporting that is out there. Does this timeline surprise you that the special counsel may in fact be wrapping up? So I think wrapping up is sometimes in the eye of the beholder. It is certainly true that there are a lot of indicators showing that they have done, let's call it a majority of the investigative work here. But I, I feel like we also have to caution folks. Prosecutors have a habit of doing what Bob Mueller used to call playing with their food. And I don't think you should assume just because a lot of the grand jury work has been done that the prosecutors themselves are ready to move to the next step. We see, to be honest, in a lot of federal investigations, we see time and time again how the decision-making process can actually get bogged down. And that's a big question right now, I think, in terms of this special counsel. Um, I like that metaphor, <laughs> disturbing though it may be to some, Joyce. Um, Devlin's suggestion that prosecutors sometimes play with their food. Do you think the other special counsel probes that are looking into documents retained at, for example, President Biden's office, that that is fa might factor into the timeline in terms of potential charging decisions in the special counsel's probe of Mar-a-Lago? I suppose it's possible, Alex, that somebody has made a decision that it would be easier, that it would help the public understand if they're announced together. But I think in terms of evaluating the case against Trump, that's just not on Jack Smith's mind. He's looking at his evidence, and I think Devlin is very accurate when he says prosecutors like to play with their food. We definitely do. And after you're done playing with it in the grand jury, then the appellate lawyers want to come along and take a look at what the food that you've got on your plate and figure out if it's enough to pass some of the legal benchmarks that they're looking for. For instance, do you have enough evidence both to obtain and to sustain a conviction? So sometimes we see a little bit um, more legal work going on in the background. I think it's relatively rare for prosecutors to consider these sort of extraneous factors like other investigations that may be underway. Um, setting aside the timeline, which, of course, is a, a mystery to all of everybody except for Jack Smith, probably. Devlin, the strength of the case here, the evidence that we're learning about, the, the fact that Evan Corcoran was a copious note taker. I mean, down to the reporting in The Guardian says, in addition to his exchange with Trump, Corcoran described Trump's facial expressions and reactions whenever they discussed the subpoena. The unusually detailed nature of his notes is said to have irritated Trump, who only learned about them after the notes themselves were subpoenaed. This is a what sounds like a treasure trove of information, especially since Mr. Nauda isn't cooperating. Um, I wonder how and what, what your questions would be for Evan Corcoran if you had access to these notes. I mean, what, what, would, what sort of passages here would be of most interest to you? So I think Corcoran's account is important, not so much as, as a direct or intended witness against the former president. But I think Corcoran's notes are very important for one basic question that has hovered over this case the entire time, which is, did the former president himself, not anyone around him, the, the former president himself, did the former president himself lie to people around him about what he had uh, even after the subpoena was issued? That is really the crux of this case. And were those lies knowingly or unknowingly conveyed to the government? That is the whole core of this case. So I don't think Evan Corcoran is a willing or even necessarily particularly fulsome witness for the government. But I think those notes and, and the broader picture of what Corcoran says he was told is important to understand the president's own words and actions. Yeah, I, I would say, and Joyce, I wonder how you read this, the very fact that Trump's lawyer, who, by the way, is still working for Trump, the fact that he's taking these notes in the first place suggests to me and other people uh, that this is someone who maybe knew the kind of client he was dealing with, right? I mean, it doesn't seem like common practice for a lawyer to be jotting down notes about what his, his client's facial expression was when they talked about the subpoena. I mean, that seems out of the ordinary, at least to me. Does it to you? It really does. It's much more the stock and trade of a prosecutor, which Evan Corcoran once was um, in the District of Columbia. It's what you do when you're interviewing a witness and you're trying to figure out if they're credible and what kind of information they might have. 
And it reminds me very much of the point in the Mueller investigation where Trump is, uh, we're told in the report that Trump learned that his White House counsel, Don McGahn, took copious notes. And Trump expressed alarm and said that he'd never had a lawyer who took notes and he didn't understand why that was happening. That suggests to me that the former president is not someone who likes to have people taking a, a written record of his conduct. And the fact that Corcoran has it here is important. It does suggest he had a certain um, healthy amount of concern about himself. But Alex, what's so remarkable here is that we've seen instance after instance where some of the best witnesses against the former president are his own lawyers. It is such an uncommon occurrence to see the attorney-client privilege pierced by the crime fraud exception. But I think it's just become dinner table talk in America. We're all conser you know, conversant with this notion that when a, a client uses a lawyer, it doesn't have to be a conspiracy. It can literal be, literally be the client asking the lawyer for advice that they can then use to admit a crime, that the relationship no longer blocks that evidence from scrutiny by prosecutors. And that's what's happened here. Right. And to that point, to elaborate on what you were saying earlier, Devlin, the, the, this can show what Andrew Weissman referred to as the mens rea, his intent in all of this, which, seem, which seems to be the key, right? The piercing of the attorney-client privilege reveals the cooperation or lack thereof between the client and his lawyer. The fact that Trump may have obfuscated or downright outright lied to Evan Corcoran. And presumably there are other lawyers in the mix who told Trump, this is what you need to do. This is why you need to return these documents. This is how the declassification process works. I mean, there's probably not just one lawyer here that can attest to the Trump's state of mind as it concerned the document, giving the documents back to the DOJ. Right. And that gets to a really important factual point in this case that it's important to remember, particularly with Evan Corcoran. Evan Corcoran is brought into this late after other lawyers have talked to Trump about this. So Evan Corcoran, in a way, comes into this cold and has to get a lot of his information from the former president. That puts Evan Corcoran sort of at the mercy of Trump's version of events when he's brought in late. And I think that is part of the reason why his notes are so important and part of the reason why what Evan Corcoran is told may be significantly different than the facts because he is new to the issue. Yeah, I, there's another piece of this that I think is important, if not specifically legally, but for the narrative, which is why did Trump want to hold on to these documents? And Devlin, you had a piece that I found seminal. It's like bookmarked on my browser about the, the, Trump's sort of motivation for all of this, which sounds like it was vanity. And yet we ha you have some new reporting um, and The Times has some reporting about the DOJ subpoenaing financial records from the Trump organization, specifically as it pertained to business deals that he made since 2017. Can you talk a little bit about those business deals and how they may dovetail with the Mar or how they do dovetail with the Mar-a-Lago investigation? Right. So the subpoena that went out in April asked for information on essentially two types of things. One, what foreign nation business deals did the Trump organization make from 2017 on? Now, Trump and his aides have long said they made no such deals while he was the president. But they did make such a deal in Oman after he stopped being the president. So what various folks have said to me is, look, if you are going to look at this topic, it's fine. But to, to a lot of people who have dealt with this, it seems to be more of a box checking exercise to make sure they aren't missing anything. Is there some lurking financial motive to these things? Um, and that's, a, I think, an understandable thing for prosecutors to look at. But that doesn't necessarily mean there's a smoking gun there or even a gun at all. Uh, uh, I got to ask you, Joyce, there is the legal sort of narrative or the narrative as it pertains to legal exposure. And then there is the narrative in terms of how guilty this makes Trump in the court of public opinion. The motivation part, I think a lot of Americans are asking why, why do all of this? And the information that we have so far suggests it may not have been more than ego. And I wonder if you think that matters in terms of this broader investigation, that it might not have been to do a deal with some foreign government or, you know, sell classified documents for personal financial gain. So motive is rarely an element in a criminal case. Often it's enough to prove, um, Alex, what Andrew calls mens rea, state of mind. 
and then the actions, the actus reus of the crime, and, and those two things, and perhaps some additional circumstances. Here, when we're thinking about classified material, it's the fact that these are NDI documents, that they are, um, that they pertain to national interests. And so that's enough to convict in a courtroom. And prosecutors are very skilled at explaining to a jury the absence of evidence of a motive and why they don't have to prove it. Although juries are human and they love to hear about motive, sometimes that can help to bring a case home. But when we get into the court of public opinion, you know, we have this notion that there are some things that are just awful. They may not be unlawful, but they are awful. And they are the sorts of conduct that should bar someone from holding office. Five years ago, I might have thought that committing a sexual assault would be one of those. Apparently, that's not the case anymore. And something that we'll look for very carefully as this investigation begins to wind down is whether some of the conduct, even if it doesn't end up being charged, is the kind of conduct that will convince and that will sway public opinion and say, here's someone who is so cavalier about handling the nation's secrets that he's simply unsuited for office.